Hello, Emmanuel here. Today we have a new render in PBR series video, and I'm going to show you how to export a material from Substance Painter and use it in Blender with Cycles and Eevee from scratch. As you probably know, there are a few ways to do this. For example, you can load the textures using the Node Wrangler add-on for a basic PBR setup, or you can use my plugin if you need to use some additional or optional maps, or if you want to set it all up in just one click. But today I'm going to explain how to do it manually. And if after learning the how-to you want to know more about my plugin, the link is in the description. Anyway, let's open Painter. The most important thing that we need to have is a Metal Roughness project. This is the default behavior, so if you don't have a template selected when you create your project, it will be Metal Roughness. While you could use a specular glossiness workflow for some materials, that will require sometimes a more complex shader, and it will be necessary match closely to what we see in Painter. So unless you really need to use a specular glossiness workflow, you should try to avoid it. If you have a project already and want to know which workflow is being used, just go to the texture set settings and check the channels. If you see base color, metallic and roughness, you are good to go. Now let's export the textures. Usually, we could use the documents channel template, but for the sake of thoroughness in this video, we're going to create our own template. Most PBR materials need at least three maps, base color, roughness and normal. And if our material have metal and non-metal parts, then we also need a form map called metallic. Let's add them. We start with an RGB map, name it Texture Set Base Color, and select the base color from the input maps. Then a gray map, name it Texture Set Metallic, and select Metallic from input maps. Next, another gray map, name it Texture Set Roughness, and select Roughness from input maps. And finally, an RGB map named Texture Set Normal. Here's where things can be confusing, because we have four different options for the normal one in input maps, one in mesh maps, and two in converted maps. The one we want is the normal OpenGL from converted maps, but I will quickly explain what is the difference between the four. The normal in the input maps will contain only the normal information defined in the painter layer stack, meaning that if you use mesh maps that you bake from a high poly, this information will not be included. The normal from mesh maps only includes information of the bake high poly. Any changes you add in the Painter Layer stack will not appear. And finally, we have the normal OpenGL and DirectX from the converted maps. Both of them have the layer stack data and the baked maps data, so either one will work, since the only difference is that the green channel of the map is inverted. This can easily be fixed at shader level by inverting the green channel. We select OpenGL over DirectX because it's the one that works better with Cycles and Eevee. Now, before exporting the maps, we need to set the correct bit depth for them. The bit depth will depend on the type of workflow we are using. If it's a linear workflow, then we need to have the bit depth of 32 and use a format like EXR. That way, we'll keep enough information in the image to change the color space if we need to. If we are using an sRGB workflow, most of the maps will have 8 bits, with a few exceptions that will have at least 16 bits. We need to do this because we want to avoid star stepping artifacts in our maps, and the rule to know which maps require 16 bits is pretty simple. If a map does not represent a color and its information needs precision in their decimal values, then it needs to be 16 bits at least. The most common maps that require 16 bits are the normal map, the height map, the displacement map, and the anisotropy rotation. The rest usually are fine with 8 bits. We will be using this RGB workflow in this video, so let's set the normal bit depth to 16 and export the textures. Now it's time to open Blender. All I did to the file was to import the same mesh we used in Painter, set the render engine to Cycles Experimental, and I added the same HDR environment that we have in Substance Painter, in this case, Tomoko Studio. Now let's select our asset, go to the object context in the shader editor, and we have two nodes, the material output and the principlet BSDF. One important thing to notice is that the principlet node is using GGX as its distribution, which is the same used by Painter. Let's begin importing our maps. First, we'll add the base color, we create an image texture node, and connect the color output to the base color of the principlet node. We open the base color texture, and now we need to set the color space. The rule of thumb for the color space is that if you are using a linear workflow, your color space needs to be linear or raw. But if you are using an sRGB workflow, as we are using right now, if the map has color information like base color, emissive, transmissive, or ambient occlusion maps, we set the color space to sRGB. If it's not color information like the normal, height, metallic, etc., then we can set it to non-color, linear, or raw. Since this one is the base color, we want to use an sRGB color space. Sometimes you'll see the base color map all wrong, 
This is because the image texture node doesn't know how to get the UVs of your geometry or the UVs assigned are the wrong ones. To fix that, you have three options, depending on the issue. The first one is to verify that the UVs that are enabled from rendering are the ones that you want to use. The second one is to add a texture coordinate node and connect the UV output to the image texture node vector. And the third option is to create a UV map node and connect it to the vector. The UV map node can be more useful if you have multiple UV maps in your geometry, because with this node, you can select which UV map you want to use, while the texture coordinate node will always select the default one. Since I only need one UV map in this geo, I'll use the texture coordinate. Let's add the next image texture node for the roughness. We open the image. Set the color space to raw since this is a non-color data. Connect the texture coordinate to the vector and connect it to the roughness input. Now it's time to add the metallic map. As I said before, this map is only necessary if the texture we are using has metal and non-metallic parts. If our material is only non-metal, like these tiles, it will be better to set the metallic value to zero. And if it's only metal, like this clean metal plate, then we only need to set the metallic value to one. That way we don't waste RAM memory with an extra texture. But remember, if our metal plate has rust, dirt or similar, it won't be only metal anymore and it will need a metallic map, because it's a common practice to give rust and dirt parts gray values in the metallic map. In our case, we don't have metallic parts, so we could leave the metallic at zero, but for the sake of thoroughness, let's add it anyway. Let's add the image texture node. Open the metallic map. Again, this is not color information, so we set the color space to raw, connect the texture coordinate to the vector, and connect it to the metallic input. And finally, we need to add the normal map. So we create the image texture node, open the normal texture, again set the color space to raw because this is not color information, and connect the texture coordinate UV to the vector. Now we need to add an extra node called normal map, and this node has two main parameters, the space that needs to be set to tangent space and the strength that will set the intensity of the normal map. Connect the texture node to the color input and the normal output to the normal input of the principled node. And now we have the basic PBR setup, and this setup works in both Cycles and EV. Let's repeat the process for the remaining materials. And if we compare the results to what we have in Painter, it seems like it's working. Now that we created a basic PBR setup, let's check how to use some of the optional maps that are available in Substance Painter. Let's begin with the height map. First, we verify that our break has some high channel information. Then, in the Substance Painter template, we add a new grid map. We call it Texture Set Height, and we grab the height data from the input maps. Since this map requires precision, otherwise we'll have some search stepping problems, we set the bit depth to 16, and we export the textures again. Now in Blender, we have two ways to add the height information, at material level or at object level. If you want to add it at material level, all the things with the same material will use the same parameters, which might not be what you want, for example, if you only want to use the height if the item is close to the camera. To implement it, we need to create an image texture node and a displacement node. Connect the texture coordinate to the vector, connect the image to the displacement height, and the displacement to the material output displacement input. Open the height map, set the color space to raw since this is not color data, and the displacement node we have two parameters, the mid level which will tell the render if it needs to push the geometry inwards or outwards. Painter uses a height range from 0 to 1, so you need to set the value at 0 0.5. And the scale that will define the amount of displacement. And it's working. 
Remember that if you want a good displacement result, you need a lot of geometry. An easy way to get it is to add a subdivision modifier to the geometry, but this will impact performance. If you are using cycles, a good way to get a better balance between quality and performance is to set the feature to experimental, and you'll get a new option in your subdivision modifier, called Adaptive Subdivision. Enable it, and you'll get the best of both worlds. Consider that this feature is still experimental, so use it with caution. To add information at object level, we need to go to the Modifiers tab and add a Displace Modifier. Create a new texture. Then go to the Texture Details, open the Height Map, and set the color space to raw. Back in the Displace Modifier, set the coordinates to UV, the mid level to 0.5, and adjust the strength. As you can see, we get the same result, but the displacement will only occur in the specific object. It is important to notice that both methods of adding the height information will work with cycles, but adding the height at material level won't work on EV. Only adding it at object level will. The next option or map we're going to use is the ambient occlusion. This map is generally more used in real-time renderers like EV, Toolbag, Unity, and Unreal as a way to fake some extra shadows. In non-real-time renderers like Cycles, it might not be that necessary, but some people add it because they like how the extra darkness in the crevices sell the depth of the material. The easier way to add it is by multiplying the ambient occlusion to the base color, so let's do it. First, we need to check that we actually have some ambient occlusion data in our painted project. To ensure we have it, we either need to have the ambient occlusion mesh map or have the ambient occlusion channel in the layer stack. Now let's add the ambient occlusion to our export preset. We create a new gray map, Set it to Texture Set Ambient Occlusion and grab the Ambient Occlusion data. Here we have a similar situation as with the normal map. We have three Ambient Occlusion options, one in Input Maps, one in Mesh Maps, and one in Converted Maps. As with the normal map, the Ambient Occlusion from the Input Maps will only export the information of the Painter's Layer Stack. The one from the Mesh Maps will only export the information of the Baked Mesh Maps, and the Mix.io will export both, so we'll select the Mix.io. Now, since this map will be multiplied by the base color, we'll treat it as a color map, so the bit will be 8. We export the textures again, and back in Blender, we add the image texture node, open the ambient occlusion texture, set the color space to sRGB, and connect the texture coordinates to the vector. We add a mix node and set it to multiply. and connect the base color to the color 1 and the ambient occlusion to the color 2 and the result to the principal base color. Now we can control the intensity of the effect with the factor parameter of the mix node. As you can see, the difference is minimum, but it's there, so it is up to you if you want to use it. Next, let's use the emissive map. Again, first we verify that our break has some emissive channel information. Then in the templates, we add a new RGB map. We call it texture set emissive and grab the emissive from the input maps. This is a map color, so the bit depth of 8 is enough. Back in Blender, we add the image texture node, open the emissive map, then set the color space to sRGB because the information is color related. Connect the texture coordinate to the vector and connect the output to the emission input of the principal material and the emission is working, but the intensity of the emission is not controllable. So let's fix that. We add a mix node and set it to multiply. And add a value node. Set the factor to one, then connect the emission texture to color one and the value to the color two, and the output of the multiply to the emission. Now with the value, we can adjust the emission intensity. Now it's time to check the opacity map. This one is also pretty straightforward. We check if the channel is available in the Painter project, and then add it to the export template. We add a gray map, call it texture set opacity, set 
Since this will only be a non-color data mask, we can use 8-bits. We export the textures again. And in Blender, we add an image texture node. Open the opacity map. Set the color space to raw. Connect the texture coordinates to the vector. We connect the node to the alpha input. And it's working. But if we go to Eevee, it's not working at all. Instead of the transparency, we have a black color. To fix that, we need to go to the material settings and change the blend mode for opaque. That is the one that is causing the issue. So our options are three alpha variations that we can use. Alpha blend sometimes will do some weird stuff, where we can see both the front and back faces of the polygons at the same time. Alpha hashed or alpha clip might generate the results you are expecting, but the cleanest one in my opinion is alpha clip. Next it's time to check the scattering. In Painter, the scattering works as a grayscale mask. The rest of the parameters are actually at shader level, so the process is relatively simple. We check that the channel is available, then we add it to export templates as a gray map. We call it texture set scattering, and since this is a grayscale mask, we can use 8 bits. We export, and in Blender, we add an image texture node, open the scattering map, set the color space to raw, connect the texture coordinate to the vector, and connect it to the subsurface input of the principle node. Now, in order to get the spectral result, we need to modify the subsurface color to what we had in Painter. If the intensity is too strong, then you can add a mix node. Connect the scattering texture to the color 1 and the mix node to the subsurface, set the color 2 to black, and then with the factor you can control the intensity. Finally, adjust with the surface radius how deep you want the scattering to be. The last optional map we'll see is an isotropy. This usually comes with two channels, the isotropy level that works as a mask, and the isotropy rotation that will have the information on how to distort the light. Let's check that we have both channels in our painter project. Now in the export template, we add two grayscale maps. We name the first one texture set and isotropy level and grab the anisotropy level from the input maps and the second one texture set and isotropy rotation and we grab the anisotropy angle. For the level, since it will be a mask, we can leave it as 8 bits, but the rotation has angle information, so probably we need more than 8 bits, so we set it to 16 and we export the textures again. And in Blender, we create an image texture node, open the anisotropy level, set the color space to raw since it's not color information, connect the texture coordinate to the vector, and connect it to the anisotropic input. Then we add another image texture node, open the anisotropy rotation, Set the color space to raw again, we connect the texture coordinate to the vector, and we connect it to the isotropic rotation. And in the render, we can see the effect. But if we go to EV, we cannot see it, since an isotropic is not supported in EV for now. There are some alternative ways to fake it, but that probably will be a future video. Well, that's all for now. In part 2, I'll talk about how to use Udin with Susan's Painter and Cycles and Eevee inside Blender. See you next time.